For those who don't know me, my name is Michael Allen. I'm the associate pastor here at Crosspoint. Gretchen and Dave, I don't know why I said it in that order, Dave and Gretchen um, are away at a retreat together. It's called a Be Still Retreat where they spend a week in prayer and, and just contemplation and resting in the Lord. So he will be returning next week. Um, and after today, we'll see if I'm here. Who knows? <laughs> One quick thing, there is a very, very brief roof update with some encouraging news that will happen right after service. In fact, we're going to cheat. You're not even going to be allowed to leave until we do it. So at the end of the service, we're going to have a song. We're going we're to close in worship, and then I'm going to invite Brian Reck up after that song to give the update, and then you will receive the benediction to head out to your day. So it will be a short update, I promise. I've seen the script, and Brian Reck, unlike myself, is very script oriented, so it should be good. Uh, I have his big teleprompter if he, if he needs it. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. These are the opening words, not to the books we're going to be studying, but to that gospel, pro, the prologue of John's gospel, which Ashley read from earlier. We spent a little over a year in that gospel together. We ended it early this year. So if you were not around for that, I would encourage you. I mean, it is 52 messages. You can be blessed as we walk through John. But we're continuing in the study of John's writings because John has given us some of the most important words for understanding the very deity of Christ. So today we'll be starting in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the series that we've called Walking in the Light. If you have not yet taken time to watch that Bible Project video with the, with the kind of overview of the books, I would encourage you to do so. The past few series, we've actually just played it, um, but we're, we're not going to today. If you aren't sure where to get it, never fear. It's in the Crosspoint Connection that came out past, this past Monday. You can also find a link to it on our Facebook page, or you can even just go to YouTube. It's super easy. You just type in 123 John Bible Project and search it, and it'll pop right up. It's about 10 minutes. If you haven't seen the other videos, it's a great video for even bringing and inviting your, your children or younger people into, and it's just a really wonderful overview that will actually help explain some things about how John writes that, I, that we won't have as much time to go through in our messages. So I want to say a couple of things, first in these three books of the Bible, then on the series, and then we're going to go into the first few verses of these words of God penned by man through the inspiration of the Spirit. First, regarding these books, there's much depth to be plumbed here, more than we can cover. However, it can feel confusing, especially in this first letter, if you're unfamiliar with ancient writing styles. I confess, even if you are somewhat familiar with ancient writing styles, it can still be confusing. Because John is using this technique called amplification, and this is something that the, the, the Bible Project video shows kind of visually what's happening, and it's super helpful. But what I want to say is that there are two main themes in John's work, in these letters that we're seeing. The first is that God is light. The second is that God is love. I would encourage you as we go through this series, this might seem like a tall order, but, but hear me, I think you can all do this. I would encourage you as we go through this series together to actually read every week 1 John, once or twice. And while you're at it, read 2 and 3 John. If you haven't looked at it yet, they're really short. But you can read all three of these books, no joke, in like 20 minutes. If you talk fast like I sometimes do, less than that. But I would encourage you a couple of times every week as we go through this series, bring your family in. Just read it. Let the, I can talk all I want. I have what Lee Eklov calls the gift of gab, but I do not have near the power that the words of God have. 
And so I would encourage you, it will honestly, truly help you better grasp what we talk about through this series if you spend time reading these words over and over so that you might be, uh, uh, so that the Holy Spirit kind of has time to work in its, his formation within you. Second, regarding this series, so this series is going to take us uh, through, into and through Advent. For those of you who aren't church calendar people, that's just Christmas season. Um, and then starting in the new year, we're going to tackle the final, uh, I, was said, I was told not to use the word Joanine, the final work of John, uh, which is the book of Revelation. Um, I'm going to give you this for free. It is the book of Revelation, not the book of Revelations. So for some of you, that might be the most important thing you learned today. Um, <laughs> but we call this series Walking in the Light. Because John is encouraging us all over his writings He's encouraging us to push deeper into our faith, to walk more in a more submissive and sold-out way in the light of Jesus. He's encouraging us to not be content with what are called besetting sins, these sins that seem to continually afflict us. He writes to encourage us to, to not be content to merely be friendly with each other, but rather to love each other deeply as Jesus himself commanded us. Our prayer as leaders, our hope for you, is that as we pursue God's revealed word in these passages, that you will find yourself challenged and pushed deeper into God's family on the basis of God's love, not on some merely kind of moral, uh, moral humanism that maybe has some Venn diagram crossover with shared values, not merely because this is your favorite social event that happens every week, but rather because the truth that God has saved us is saving us still and will ultimately save us into eternal communion with him should suffuse every facet of your being. One manifestation of that, one method which that plays out in our lives is through the bride of Christ, his spirit-breathed church, you and I. So, with that in mind, let's go into our text for today. If you're not there yet, please turn to 1 John in your Bibles. Um, I always do this, but I would encourage you, even if you love digital Bibles, I love digital Bibles, I would encourage you in this moment to untether yourself from external influence. Silence or turn off the notifications. Don't let that email hit you and pull you out of this. Grab an analog Bible. If you don't have one with you, there are some that are right in the pew in front of you. If you don't know where 1 John is about, you're like, I need the digital Bible because I need to figure out where 1 John is, right? And it's easier to scroll. Um, there's a table of contents in the front of the Bible. Or, or if you use the pew Bible, I can tell you, that we will be on page 1054. It's really, really close to the end of the Bible. But it's not the end of the story. Will you join with me in a prayer as we prepare to receive God's word? Father, as we prepare to receive your word, may your Holy Spirit, our breath and source of life, open our eyes and our ears. May you reveal to us the pearl of your word that we might joyfully and excitedly reject all else for your truth's sake. Lord, may you still our anxieties and our restless minds, calm our spirits, and bring us into the comforting rest of your presence, O God of peace. Amen. Reading from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and, uh, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard, what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the word of the Lord. Notice, if you will, the parallels in John's writing to the opening moments in his gospel. 
a focus on beginnings. They aren't quite the same beginning, but John is always and ever concerned with our beginnings, the beginning of creation, the beginning of the gospel narrative that begins with the life of Jesus, and your beginning when you step into new creation as you confess Christ as Lord. John cares about our beginnings. And here we see him setting the stage for the overwhelming focus of his writing through these letters, the work of Jesus through his life, death, and resurrection. It would be easy for us as we read through this to read quickly, and it's really easy for us to presume that what John talking about, is talking about here is only the idea of the embodiment of Jesus. After all, he's using sense language. We touched, we heard, we saw. Obviously, he's talking about the person of Jesus, and certainly that is an aspect of what he is talking about, but I, I want you to see that I think he actually means more than just Jesus' physicality. When he refers to hearing, seeing, looked at, which seems like the same thing, right, but there, there are differences there, touched, initially what he's referring to, I, I would contend, is the embodiment of God in the person known as Jesus and the gospel outworking of Jesus' divine work on the cross and the resurrection. And I think we can see this using two small words that are so easy for us to skip over. The very first word, that, then at the end of the verse, this. He's using gender-neutral pronouns. Now, this might seem odd, like, Michael, why are you focusing on this? But everywhere else in John's writing, when he refers to Jesus, he makes no mistake, he uses masculine pronouns. He, him, he uses that language. So when he says that and this, this is different, it should cause us to wonder, what are you talking about, John? What are you referencing here? His scope is larger than, but certainly no less than, the embodiment of Jesus. This message that John has, he says, uh, it, it concerns the word of life. And here we see the movement from the gospel narrative as a whole down to the person of Jesus. The echoes of, of his gospel prologue again ring out. Those receiving these letters, having them read to them, would no doubt be familiar with the logos of God, the word of God, the word made flesh. And here, John says he is the word of life. So we can be certain that his subject matter is Jesus. And verse 2, we see him move into the incarnation. This life appeared to us. It was made incarnate. He says at the end of the verse, it was, he was with the Father and has appeared to us. John seems to be pursuing something akin to a succinct summary of where the authority for our beliefs comes from. The word of life, the word made flesh. We can hear almost maybe as, as what we call John 3.16 seems to be cried out from the page, right? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. And he, we proclaim to you, John says, the eternal life. The word of life, the ministry of Jesus, present from the beginning, appeared, was incarnate. And his ministry, which the apostles witnessed and proclaimed, was a welcoming into that eternal life. Pop quiz. Who remembers the, the thesis statement, the whole point? of the Gospel of John. That's some mumbles. Everyone's like, do we actually raise our hand? Does he actually want to? I'm a youth pastor. I'm always like, yeah, what are you guys going to say? John 20, 31. Do you remember this? These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, 1 John has a thesis statement as well. It's pretty similar. 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice the narrative that we can see happening here. 
It'll give you a big clue about why John wrote these letters, about why John is starting where he's starting. I think the path goes something like this. John is saying, believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you have life in his name. That's step one. And then we see him saying, well, now that you do believe in him, I want you to know that you have eternal life. Well, it seems like he's already said that, so what's he doing? I wonder, have any of you who confess Christ ever just wondered, doubted, feared, said, wow, am I saved? Do I have eternal life? How do I know? John is writing these letters partially to address this very concern. So as we go through it, we're going to see this theme coming back, that there are ways that we can visibly, tangibly recognize and see manifestations of the eternal life that we have in Christ. This is the purpose for which John wrote. See, the churches that John was writing to were experiencing deep fear as division happened, as people flocked to heretical beliefs about who Jesus was, or maybe even more specifically, who Jesus was not, namely God. These latter people, who, the, those who say that Jesus is not God, are rather kindly called antichrists. Get excited for those messages. So John has given us some of our key texts for understanding this mysterious reality that he's speaking on here. Jesus is both divine. He is fully God. He is the word of life. He gives eternal life. He was with the Father, but he appeared to us in the incarnation. All of John's language is set to focus us on Jesus' very Godness. And yet he was human. He was born of a woman. He was seen. He was heard. He could be touched. After the resurrection, his embodiedness continued. The disciples could touch his wounds. And then the gospel message after the, uh, the falling of the Spirit was seen. The impacts and miracle works were seen, felt, heard, touched. And John seems to be adopting this, adopting this kind of grandfatherly tone through this letter seeking to remind the churches to which he's writing, and through that to remind you of the truth on which we are formed. Jesus is God incarnate, and in him is eternal life. You're going to find that I say that a lot. In doing this, in making this proclamation, in, in making this reminder, he is inviting them inviting these churches deeper into the fellowship with the Trinity. And that means that he is inviting you, Crosspoint Church, deeper into fellowship with the Trinity. I see it in verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, fellowship is a word <laughs> that for some of us has been turned into like this thoroughly Christianese word, right? Fellowship means coffee and donuts in the morning, right? And yes, but more. Co fellowship means having a great conversation around a bonfire late at night. Yes, but more. Fellowship goes deeper than that. And I, I want to say, in this moment of the text, it may look, I just want to speak to this really briefly, it may look like John is in some way ignoring or through implication or maybe omission, rejecting the presence of the Holy Spirit, right, as, as, the Trinit as, the, as part of the Trinitarian Godhead. After all, he says that his fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, but you don't see this, this Holy Spirit referenced. I just want to assure you, John is thoroughly Trinitarian. There is a lot of Holy Spirit language all throughout this uh, letter that equates the Holy Spirit with God. But what he's pointing us to is that the Trinity, rightly understood, not fully understood, we can never fully understand the Trinity, and I know some of you are like, I want to. I get that. But the Trinity, rightly understood, exists in this strange to us divine relationship can never be fully understood, and we can never fully explain it because God, by definition, is far beyond our understanding. 
But John, later in this letter, is going to be talking a lot about love. Right? God is love. See, love is not something that God does, not only, but rather love is something that God is. And we see God's love most perfectly modeled in the love that he shares between the three persons of the Trinity. This isn't narcissism, though it might be easy for us to imagine that due to our limited understanding, our finite understanding, our lim- our, and also, I think, our sinfulness. Rather, it's the perfect expression of the very reality of who God is. Perfect, self-giving love between the three persons of the Trinity. And John is saying, we proclaim the truth of who God is to welcome you into the fellowship, to welcome you into this self-giving love. When John is, bumped by thing. When John is doing this, the, the language there might trip us up, right? Because first John invites us to him, that you will join us in our fellowship. But then we have to remember that his fellowship is with God. That is where our fellowship primarily starts. Now here is the radical truth of who we are when we are in Christ. We are the church. We are the church. The church is not a human institution, even when it is in an institutional form. Not primarily. It's God's institution, and it's God's people, and it is a place where we can uniquely experience the divine fellowship of the Trinity through the way that we live out our love of God and our love of neighbor and our love for our brothers and sisters. See, koinonia, some of you may know that word. It's kind of, it's, it's a fun little church word. Koinonia is the word that we translate fellowship, and that doesn't just mean that we're engaging in social time every Sunday, and then going back to living functionally atheistic lives throughout the rest of the week where somebody looks at us and sees us and thinks that we're just a member of the kingdom of man and not the kingdom of God. Koinonia means not only having a close relationship, coffee and donuts, talks around a campfire, but also an association based on common interests or purposes. When you believe in Christ for eternal life, you are brought into, you are grafted into, you are adopted into the family and fellowship of God, and the Holy Spirit should be changing us to align our interests with the only one who knows all and sees all and is all in all, and that is God. When you believe in Christ for eternal life, you are brought not just into the church in a universal setting— In other words, everyone from Brazil to Kenya to Ukraine to Russia to um, Israel to Palestine, everyone who worships God in spirit and truth and confesses Jesus as Lord is part of the church. It's the church universal. But you were also brought into a local church, members of this broad body of God. It gets spicy because it wouldn't be me if I wasn't spicy. (laughs) When you confess Christ, being a part of the family of the church isn't an option, it's required. It is a natural outworking of believing, moving into fellowship with a fundamentally, perfectionally relational God. Perfectly relational God. In his book, called The Local Church, uh, Pastor Edward Klink, also known as Mickey Klink, who pastors a church up in Roscoe, said this. He said, the Bible will not let Christians separate their Christianity from their local church. I gave you that one on the sheet. I didn't give you these next ones because I don't want evidence about this, all right? So let me get even spicier. Let me get even spicier, right? Because some of you are, are a little uncomfortable by that. Let me get spicier. John Calvin, everyone likes John Calvin. In his commentary on Ephesians, Ashley read from Ephesians earlier, In John John Calvin's commentary on Ephesians, he called the local church the common mother of all the godly. Referring to the local church. And if that's not spicy enough for you, Calvin is actually referencing in this moment one of the church fathers from the third century, Father Cyprian, who said he or she cannot have God for their father who has not the church for their mother. 
the fellowship with the body, including its localized division, is a part of the Christian experience. Fellowship isn't just about going and getting coffee and donuts. It's living to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, specifically through embracing God's redemptive purposes for the world in general and for individual lives in particular. And just as God is both spirit and embodied in Jesus, the church is both invisible, universal, right? All believers who worship God in spirit and truth. And it's embodied, it's localized, it's particularized. In the same way that Jesus was particularized in history to a specific place and moment, so too are you brought into a local church that is particularized in history to a specific place and moment. And John is starting this foundation with the word became flesh, the word became incarnate particularized. We don't believe in a God who, who's invisible. We believe in a God who was here historically. We don't center around just spiritual ideas. We center around a historical event. So th- all of this might seem maybe compelling to you. Some of this might feel authoritarian to you. You might be like, I am writing Dave and never letting Michael preach ever again. But it's important that we don't stop there, right? Because the Holy Spirit inspiring John brings home the point for this in verse 4. We write this to make our joy complete. When we live in a shared life with Jesus, which is primarily, but not only, manifested in your shared life with the church, the brothers and sisters in your family, we get to join in a fullness of joy. John here seems to be echoing the very words of Jesus as recorded in John's gospel. John 15, 11 said, I, Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. I'm going to say that again. He said that my joy, Jesus' joy, may be in you so that your joy may be complete. John 16, 24, Jesus says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Believe it or not, Jesus desires your joy. Jesus doesn't want you to live in this constant state of anxious questioning about whether you're in his family or not. Living out the truth of fellowship as experienced in the body of believers that cling to the apostolic witness we receive through Scripture, which proclaims that Jesus is God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, is not something that is designed to be humdrum, ho-hum, no-fun, legalistic dogmatism. Rather, it's an opportunity for joy as we allow the message of Christ to dwell presently through the power of the Holy Spirit, to dwell richly among us, that we might teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. The faith that you are brought into when you believe in Christ is an embodied, present, localized faith. It's really hard to sing hymns, songs, and spiritual songs to people who you are not next to. Yes, we have phones. There are ways to do it, and we are thankful for technology and thankful for the opportunity for people who can join us online. But I think many of us have experienced what it's like to be sung something as uncomfortable as happy birthday over the phone versus being sung happy birthday with people immediately around you, with people who deeply care for you. We are localized and particularized when we are brought into this fellowship. We are created for embodied, physical, embodied corporate worship based on the good news of the gospel. Our corporate worship together as the local church should be a place where we all individually find assurance of our faith simultaneously by loving others and by being loved. God has given us the church to function in a redemptive way, not a domineering way. We are called to model a radical and countercultural gospel unity that can only exist when we rest in the presence of the perfect fellowship of that Godhead. I don't know what you're experiencing that may cause you to doubt that. I certainly do sometimes. 
or to scoff or to respond maybe apathetically. But if we believe in the truth as presented in Scripture, if we believe in the recorded words of Jesus, that's what His desire is for us. The place that we are called to find our joy is not a job or a job title. It's not in a relationship, whether a friendship or a family relationship or a, or a boyfriend or girlfriend or a spouse. We aren't called to find joy in our money or our cars or our music or our athletic ability or our library size, even though that one hurts me, or in how capable we are to take care of ourselves, right? I'm a strong, strong guy. I don't need anybody to help me. I'm a strong, independent woman. None of those, by the way, are by themselves bad things. But that's not the thing that brings us joy. Not the fullness of joy. Not our complete joy. We write this to make our joy complete. You can find flickers of it. God gives us common grace because, you know, he says that the, the sun shines on the wicked and the righteous. We can see flickers of joy. But to make our joy complete requires us to be present in fellowship that stands on the truth of Jesus as the incarnate word of God. How's my speaking speed? Am I doing okay? I talk fast a lot, so I want to make sure I'm... When I get excited, I get even faster. I start to turn into Sonic the Hedgehog, so. I have a few final thoughts, and then we'll move to responding in song. It's important to remember, as we read all of these letters, but especially in this moment, it's important to remember where John is situating his joy. In a world of cultural relativism and enlightenment rationality and post-enlightenment, post-modernity, there are competing views of what truth is into which all of us, whether we want to or not, are dragged, trained, and taught. You can't escape that. John's starting place must be ours when we experience seasons of doubt, confusion, fear, or anxiety, which is that Jesus, God's very self, came down and lived among us in order to glorify himself through the redemptive work which only he could ever accomplish. Jesus is both, or so two, so that was one, two. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. A number of weeks ago, Leah Clough spoke on that wonderful passage in Philippians 2, 2, 5 through 11. If you haven't gone back to listen to that or if you weren't present for that, I would encourage you to to just hear the wonder of who our God is. But this is mysterious to us. It's easy to say those words together. Jesus is both fully man and fully God, but how do we, how do we conceptualize that in our brain, right? Anybody with a lick of math sense knows that 100% plus 100% isn't really a thing. And yet, and yet the mystery of God is such that it functions that way. Humanity saw this happen in real time, and yet we can't understand it fully. And God in his graciousness has given us information. He's given us his revelation so that we can know his story, we can know his character, at least partially. But he's given us something, dare I say, more important than the information. He's given us himself. He's welcomed us into that fellowship with his very self. And so my encouragement for you is to not be so caught up in the what about, well, 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 what about. I can't conceive of this. Well, what about? I can't conceive of this. Don't be so caught up in that that you miss the nail-scarred hands reaching for you to take the punishment for your sin, to bear the weight of your burdens. Jesus calls us to come to him when we are weak and weary because his yoke is easy and he will give us rest for our souls. When you make something like rationality the primary marker of what God can be, in other words, when you say, well, I can only conceive of this kind of a God, therefore that's all that God can possibly be, you immediately remake God in the image of man. Throughout all three of these books that we're going to be studying, John never separates love or light from resting on the truth of who God is. We shouldn't either. Three, you are called into blessed community when you come into fellowship with God. In our very individualistic Western world, this can be hard for us. 
We don't like to sacrifice. We don't like to prioritize an hour a week because that might cut into football time. We don't like to prioritize an hour a week because sleeping is a lot easier on Sunday mornings. Can I get an amen? But you are called into fellowship, and you will not experience the fullness of fellowship with God devoid of, separate from, fellowship with a body of believers. And it isn't always easy community. I want you to hear that. The church has a long history of doing things wrong, doing things that are opposed to Scripture. I, have, we, I, I was at a conference this past week, and there was a pastor. I'm going to goof up how he said it. But he, he basically said, when it comes to the church, only sinners are welcome here. We're not, we're not interested We're not helpful. We don't have anything for the people who are already perfect and know how life is supposed to be lived. Only sinners are welcome here. And that means that our relationships, the way that we live even out in the community is going to be messy and sometimes wrong and we should repent, lament, and confess that to God and to each other. And yet, and yet God redeems so often that work. It is much easier to hold fast to the truths of who Jesus is when times get difficult when you're surrounded by like-minded believers. This is true in, not just in church. This is true in anything, right? Like any, you know, I don't think that I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a football example because I very clearly don't play football. So like, you know, I, I, I can't do it. I can't, I can't throw this ball well. And when you have a team that's seen you throw it well, say, no, you totally can. Just keep going. We've seen you do it before. We've seen that work before. That spurs us on to accomplish it. The fellowship of believers functions to encourage one another. Hebrews says that we should spur one another on to love and good deeds. This is one of the many reasons, can't do this without plugging this, this is one of the many reasons why I deeply desire everyone in our church to be in growth groups. To work through the mess of being human to work through the mess of scheduling, to prioritize time together. Sundays are great. I love Sundays, and and I truly believe that the Sunday gathering is an essential component to our spiritual formation together. And it's important, as I'm talking about this in relation to 1 John, like the church, the institutional church today looks significantly different than it would have in 1 John. That doesn't negate that truth. So I love Sundays, but I also love gathering, and I'm sure you do too. You like the big family gatherings where you have, you know, 20 people, or when when Naomi's family gets together, it's like 100 people, and we have to rent a building. Um, But it's also really sweet to gather with your close family, right? Your immediate family. Those three to five to 12 gathering with your family in smaller moments, praying for one another, doing the work of ministry in the day-to-day, in the ordinary. God uses all throughout Scripture ordinary moments and ordinary people. Very rarely is he calling the people who are already exceptional. Remember, the first will be last and the last will be first. Such moments with your Smaller family can be moments of God's redemptive touch gently comforting you upon your back. So don't neglect Sundays. Don't neglect something like growth groups because you are not created to be a solitary, isolated creature. Even you, introverts. So I want to call you to trust in the apostolic witness given to us in Scripture, not because I said so, but because God's witness has proven faithful over the centuries, even when humanity has proved faithless. There is a deep abiding joy to be found in the fellowship of the saints, even when the sinfulness of man looms large in our vision. This past week, many of us experienced heartache as yet another school shooting flashed across the headlines. Four more killed. Richard Aspinwall, Christina Irami, Mason Shermerhorn, and Christian Angulo. This story feels so common now that it can be overwhelming, or we might even fall prey to being desensitized to the reality of sin manifesting in this way. And this can often cause us to despair, to question God, question God's goodness, question God's presence. In this moment, we have the opportunity as the church to first continue our practices of lament, 
based on this very hope of an eternal life in Christ. We can cry out to God. We can join with the families of the murder in a collective cry of, this was not how this was supposed to happen. This is not the meaning of creation. This is not the purpose of humanity. In this moment, the church has the option to stand fast against the ever-diminishing claims Satan and the powers of darkness have upon this world. Not because we're naive, not because we're blind optimists, but because we know that God is near the brokenhearted. And we know that God came to us in our brokenness. When we dwell in fellowship with God, our interests become aligned with His, and He has called us to be peacemakers in the midst of overwhelming violence. So we as a church, we lift up prayers of hurt and frustration at the death of God's good creation, and yet we remain steadfast in hope. With tears maybe of sorrow streaming down our face, we boldly face the powers of darkness that foolishly think they have a chance in this world as we protect and care for the weak, the injured, the mourning, the hurt, the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. And we can do that with linked arms together as the church, prayerfully and boldly marching forward, knowing that God has won the final victory. Friends, Jesus has come. Life has appeared to us. Jesus will come again. I find myself continuously grieving the senseless loss of human life. When I think on these four who have been murdered and the many other stories we hear, I think to myself how much more we need the church to be a church of lament, a church of justice, the church of restoration, the church as it was called to be because the world is filled with darkness and is in desperate need of hope and light, and God is light. If we take John seriously, this hope has come. If we take John seriously, we know where our joy comes from. May we see Jesus. May we proclaim Jesus. And may we link arms and do the hard yet joyful work of restoration, moving forward in bold and unapologetic love, anchored in the fellowship of the Trinity, even amid dark clouds. Because someday... Jesus will come again. And he, Jesus of Nazareth, God made flesh, the crucified lamb, the risen lion, the Christ Messiah is living and active. And he is our living hope.